hi there, I'm Valerie Francis. My guess is that you have limited writing time. And since you're here, you're curious about story theory and how it can help you write a story your readers will love. Well, I have good news for you. No matter what your current skill level is, if you're ready to deepen your understanding of how stories work, the Storytelling Fundamentals webinar series might be for you. These 90-minute sessions are laser-focused on the topics you need most. I'll be covering everything from developing characters we love to how to write a page-turner. My specialty is helping authors like you put theory into practice. Don't wonder whether your story is working. Use these tools to know that it is. For more information, go to valeriefrancis.ca slash webinars, and I'll see you there. If you want to write stories your readers will love, there are three things you need to do. Understand storytelling principles, see how other writers have applied those principles, and then use them in your own work. Here on the Story Nerd Podcast, our goal is to demystify story theory and we'll help you with the first two steps so that you can get started with the third. I'm Melanie Hill, writer, editor and poet, and I have a passion for spy stories, fairy tales and master detective novels. And I'm Valerie Francis. I'm a writer and literary editor and I focus on stories by, for and about women. On today's episode, Valerie pitched Good luck to you, Leo Grand, so that we can study empathy. This 2022 film was directed by Sophie Hyde from a screenplay by Katie Brand. And of course, there will be spoilers because we can't talk about the movie without talking about the movie. And we'd really love it if you could give our show a rating and review. For Apple Podcast listeners, you can do it right from your phone. Simply go to the show's landing page and scroll to the bottom. It's that simple. All right, Valerie, what have you got for the genres this week? Because I'm interested because, um, yeah, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'm interested what you say because I have a, a, an interesting point of view myself on this. All right. Well, for the global genre, I'm calling it a worldview maturation. And for the secondary genre, okay, Keep in mind that genre is a sliding scale. These are not silos. There is blend between them. I'm calling it a love obsession. However, it leans a little toward courtship because genuine feelings do develop. However, there never is any idea that this is going to be an ongoing relationship past you know, the end of the movie, there's not going to be a happily ever after. And it isn't a love relationship that develops, but they do develop a friendship of sorts. So it starts out as a relationship purely of sex. So that's kind of where I'm leaning in the obsession, but it ends as something more than that. And they do have intimate connection at the very end when they're actually talking heart to heart with one another has nothing to do with the sex. So I'm calling it love obsession, but it's wiggly. (laughs) What about you? Well, so I had for the global genre, a worldview revelation story. And I said that because I think Nancy moves from ignorance to wisdom. And, um, and, you know, so I I could see that very much in the story thread. And then for the secondary genre, I don't think that there is one. So that's what I'm going with this week. And I, I get what you're saying about the love obsession, but yeah, it, it, that it's, mm, (laughs) it's loose. It's very loose and very light. And so I couldn't see that fully developed. So that's why I have gone with I don't think there is one. But I also want to say that I don't think that's necessarily a problem either. I think that, you know, the, the, the how the movie is set up and the very small cast that it has, I think it makes it okay just to have an internal genre as the global genre of this story. So I'm not saying it's a And we agree it's that a it's a worldview. Yeah, we do. So, yeah, we agree that it's very, you know, 
a, an internal story for Nancy and she is the focus of the of the story. All right, so what have you got this week then for empathy? All right, empathy. Well, I have to be honest. I wasn't exactly sure what to expect with this film, but I adore Emma Thompson. So honestly, anything she is in is fine by me. I knew the premise of the story going in, obviously, and I had seen some of the trailers and some stills, all of which were in a hotel room. So I was curious to find out if indeed the whole story is in a hotel room or if it ventures outside the hotel room. And if it is in one location, I really wanted to know how they would do that. Uh, and yeah, in the, there are a couple of exceptions. Like when the story opens, we see Leo in a cafe. And in the end, Leo and Nancy are in uh, the restaurant lounge. But other than that, it's in the hotel room. The whole thing is essentially two people sitting in a room talking. And it's like watching a play. It's like they have filmed a play. And given the premise of the story, there's surprisingly little sex in it. I was expecting a lot more sex, um, but there was m a lot more story to it, which I appreciated and enjoyed. Now, before I sort of get into empathy, I want to give a heads up to anyone who wants to improve their ability to write dialogue. This movie would be a great one to study because it's pretty much all dialogue. <laughs> like I said, it's it's like a play and it's short. It's just an hour and a half. So because of that, the whole premise and the fact that it's short, I don't have a, a whole lot to say this week, not as much as I thought I would. Uh, the story the filmmakers have presented us with is interesting. There just isn't a lot of it. For example, we don't get to see Nancy in a bunch of different situations dealing with a bunch of different characters. We never see her with her children or her friends. We do see her with a former student at the end, but otherwise it is literally just her and Leo. I'm not saying this is a flaw in the storytelling. It's just a hyper-focused story, hyper-focused on one thing. So that means I only have one thing to talk about. While I was scrolling my Instagram feed this week, I came across a video of Meryl Streep. And she's actually in the video talking about how she chooses which films to work on. And essentially what she said was, if she can empathize with the character, she takes the part. So here's the quote from Meryl Streep. There has to be some recognition when you first read the material that occurs at a level that's not from the neck up a sort of concord within your soul, a deep recognition of something that you understand about this character that feels like you on some level. Even if it's perfectly horrible, you recognize yourself somewhere. Now that's from Meryl Streep. Basically, she's just talking about empathy. It's another way to think about empathy. Readers understand something about a character that feels like them in some way. They recognize themselves somewhere, even if it's a recognition of something perfectly horrible. And Baez, I don't know about you, but if it's good enough for Meryl Streep, it's good enough for me. <laughs> now on to the movie. The first thing that struck me about this film is that Nancy is very much like the character of Joan in The Wife in terms of the situation they find themselves in at that stage of their lives. Yet their lives during their younger years are totally different. Leo Grand is a film where Nancy talks almost nonstop because she's, in fact, she's talking so much, she's using it as a way to avoid having to have sex or avoid having to deal with the real issues. She's just kind of talking. In The Wife, Joan barely speaks at all. Now, we can easily imagine, though, that if we had seen scenes between Nancy and her husband, that the relationship would have been very much like that of Joan and Joe in The Wife. We know that from what Nancy says about what her marriage was like. I think this film does offer us a terrific example of empathy as being about shared emotions rather than shared experiences. At least I don't know anyone who has hired a sex worker 
Um, not that they're telling me, maybe they don't tell me cause they figure it's going to show up in a book somewhere. <laughs> so it is possible, uh, for your reader to share the experiences of your main character, but it's not necessary. The sharing needs to happen on the emotional level, not on the literal action level. And what I like about the way empathy is developed in this film is that it's gradual. There isn't one big moment that grabs us. Instead, it's the accumulation of moments of revelations about her life and her situation. So the empathy kind of creeps up on you. All right. So if empathy is about shared emotions, what is Nancy feeling and why? Well, in a nutshell, Nancy feels as though this is her final attempt at a life. She can see her friends fading away at the edges, and she knows that is what's happening to her as well, and she is desperately trying to stop it. And she feels this way because she's been living a life that she, like so many of us, has been taught to live. She has been socially conditioned to be a quote-unquote good girl. She has lived a very pious, self-sacrificing life, and it's killing her inside. It makes her feel like she hasn't really lived at all. She's done everything that has been expected of her. She has put others ahead of herself, and the three times she dared to want something more for herself, she was shot down. So here's what we find out in, in the course of the conversation. As a young woman, Nancy dared to think that her calves looked good, and her mother criticized her for it, telling her that vanity is a weakness. As a wife, she dared to tell her husband what she wanted sexually, and his reaction was to tell her that it demeaned them both. As a career woman, she wanted to try and make a difference in her students' lives, And the system saddled her with a bunch of administrative and political boxes she had to tick so that her entire working life was one soul-destroying year after another. Now, this is something that I and an awful lot of women I know can empathize with. We are expected, absolutely expected, to be the one doing everything for everyone else. We are expected to be subservient. Now, if we explicitly ask our children or or our spouses, do you expect me to be subservient? Of course, they're going to say no. They're not consciously doing it. But women are expected to be the caregivers. And we are expected to give that care to the detriment of ourselves. Why is it so many women lost their jobs during COVID lockdown? It's more women than men. It's because the women were expected to leave their jobs and look after their children. It was assumed that women would put the raising of the children ahead of their own careers. It's not expected or assumed that the men would do it. And the men who do make these choices are either criticized for being lazy or they're put on a pedestal and considered saints for making such a sacrifice. It's just the way our society is. Now, Nancy's children are, by all accounts, good people. They're grown adults now, and her son might be dull and too much like his father, but he seems to be independent. Her daughter, however, calls her mother any time of the night or day and talks about herself. It doesn't seem that the daughter asks her mother about what Nancy is doing or even if Nancy is okay. So even as an adult, her daughter is expecting her to be at the beck and call and to sacrifice herself for her daughter. The bottom line is that Nancy feels invisible, and that's exactly how Joan felt, and that's exactly how an awful lot of women in the world today, of a certain age, 50 and up, just feel invisible. And there, there might be women in their 40s who feel invisible too. And when they start to have kids and suddenly the kids are their priority and, you know, all that happens. We start to feel ourselves fade away at the edges. 
just like Nancy described her friends and herself as fading away at the edges. I think that is a beautiful and apt description. And there are an awful lot of women who get to a time in their life and they feel like this is their last chance to have a life. Now it comes up in the film that there are men Nancy's age who want to date her. She is a beautiful woman, but as she says, they're all old men and old men are looking for a caregiver. Any relationship she would have had with those men would have been repeats of her marriage. And she wants more. She wants to feel like a woman. She says, a woman of the world. That's how she puts it. Even acknowledging that she wants more makes her feel like a dirty old woman. It makes her feel bad about herself. She's very critical of herself. And she says she feels like Rolf Harris, which is a great line because Leo totally misses the reference. And it's a, just a wonderful way to highlight the age gap between them. Wanting more makes Nancy think that she is pathetic. She has no self-esteem and no feeling of self-worth. And I know an awful lot of women like that. She's at a stage in her life where her children are grown and gone and her husband is dead. She is alone and wondering, is this all there is? And we saw that same thing in As Good As It Gets. Melvin is alone and lonely and he asks the question, what if this is all there is? What if this is as good as it gets? Melvin wanted more, and so he made an effort to change his ways and develop a relationship with Carol. Nancy wants more too, but her version doesn't involve getting into a relationship. For Nancy, it's about stepping into her own and becoming independent. It's clear that her time with Leo is merely the first step toward this independence. So empathy in uh, Good Luck to You, Leo Grand, it has nothing to do with Leo Grand. It's all about Nancy. But empathy sort of reveals itself a bit at a time. Even the example where uh, she's in her lingerie and at the last moment discovers that she's left the tag on. Well, you know, and she tries to hide the tag. Yeah, we've been there. We've all been there. <laughs> um, that's kind of all I have to say about the movie. It is, like I said, it's a short movie that is hyper-focused on one thing. It's just two people in a room talking. Melanie, what do you have? Do you have more to say? Did you run into the same problem that I did this week? I, yeah, I kind of did. I, I, I think I really did. And I thought, you know, looking for stakes in this was really interesting you know, because like you said, there were only two people on screen for most of the time and they're mainly in a hotel room. So we don't see how what's at stake for Nancy and Leo impacts their lives. We don't see their normal lives or their lives outside really of, of that hotel room. Um, so, you know, what's at stake isn't on the screen and we don't see Nancy in particular, we don't see what she has to lose or gain and how that will play out in her everyday life, and we don't see it. Now, as I've said in previous episodes, right, this season um, I've put out a bit of an equation about stakes. So, you know, stakes equals the objects of desire plus the consequences and likelihood of the risks and opportunity events happening in a story at any given point in time. So when I look at Good Luck to You, Leo Grand, I think the objects of desire are relatively simple for both characters, right? So Leo wants to do the job he's been hired to do and Nancy wants to have some sexual experiences that she's never had during her marriage. So these are mutually aligned objects of desire. So one would think that achieving them isn't going to be that difficult. <laughs> However, the likelihood of both achieving their objects of desire changes and it changes because of two emotions and they are shame and guilt. But it's shame which 
is the value scale that I think this movie moves along and the obstacles and opportunities also move along in this movie. So what's at stake for Nancy, I believe, is overcoming shame and living a fuller life. Or she can surrender to the shame and she can live the same life that she's always lived. Now, shame and guilt drive a lot of Nancy's behaviours and her dialogue. So, you know, and here's a very quick description of both just to understand what the difference is between the two. So guilt is about wrong actions and shame is about being wrong as a person. And I, and I got that very quick description from a website called verywellmind.com. Now, we understand the depth of Nancy's shame via a summary of her life, right? So she was married to a good but boring man who was very steak and three veg kind of in the bedroom. She's the mother of two adult children and she was a high school religious teacher. So all of this grips her and it has a hold on her, especially, I think, the religious teacher role. Now, Nancy is very internally and externally judgmental and this comes from the shame and the guilt that she harbours. So the shame in Nancy creates a massive amount of internal conflict that she pushes outwards towards Leo and onto Leo. So her guilt comes from being with Leo to achieve sexual fulfilment. Leo and Nancy discuss this, right, and at the 36-minute mark, Leo actually says to Nancy, you know, you, you need to let go of the thing inside that grips you, you know, that judges you, that watches you from the outside. And then there's also the moment when Leo asks Nancy to look at her reflection in the mirror and then she says to him, I've always been ashamed of myself, of my body, and what's wrong with it. Now, these two pieces of dialogue, I think, sum up what Nancy really needs from Leo. So her want or her object of desire is to have some sexual experiences that she's never had during her marriage. But she actually needs to like her body and let go of the shame that she has about wanting to experience a fulfilling physical life. However, Nancy is constantly using her shame to put obstacles in the way of her achieving her own objects of desire and her needs. And again, this creates the conflict between her and Leo. Now, at times, this conflict actually left me feeling a bit uncomfortable because Nancy really tries to shame Leo, right? She sort of takes on a motherly role with him. And while I get why, so this is the setup for Nancy to overstep into Leo's boundaries, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, but what I found odd and what I found and when I found myself disengaging with Nancy was when she was really trying to shame Leo and I would actually start to become more engaged with Leo's character when that happened. And I thought that was really interesting while watching this movie. And I, I'm not sure if that was deliberate or if that was just a side effect of, you know, me and my experience of the movie. So what we see as the movie progresses is Nancy's incremental movement along the shame stakes scale. So she takes two steps forward and one step backwards over the course of her meetings with Leo. And the backwards steps occur when shame rears its head. But this is a type of resistance to change, right? And it's also a very human reaction. Change is hard and changing core beliefs about ourselves is exceptionally difficult. Now, a lot of the change in Nancy takes place off screen but we do see the process of her trying to change on screen. And we do see how shame and guilt keep building in her, even as she gets closer and closer to her objects of desire. 
and we see how she tries desperately as that happens to drag Leo more into her shame. So, and at the third meeting, right after Nancy tells Leo, you know, my body is no longer the carcass I've been heaving around for 30 years. So shortly after she says that, she reveals that she has overstepped the mark and she has found out what Leo's real name is. And when he reacts badly to that, Nancy asks Leo, why is he so ashamed? Why does he lie to his mother about what he does? And surely his mother would be proud of him. And I I found that line of questioning quite frustrating. Right Now, Leo responds by telling Nancy that his mother tells everyone that her son Connor, which is his real name, is dead. She disowned him when she was when he was 15 years old. And if she saw who the real Connor was, then she didn't like it. So he could feel her disapproval because he wasn't what his mother wanted or imagined for herself. Now, Leo then goes on to call himself a broken little whore, which is very reductive and judgmental and laden with shame. Now, I'm going to put it out there, right? I don't think that Leo's personal story adds to the film. I think Leo is clearly not ashamed of his line of work and he is genuinely finding joy in the pleasure that he brings to people. But the story forces the narrative about his mother being ashamed of him and it implies that he bears some remorse about this. Now, if we go back to the definition of shame, which is a belief that there's something wrong with you as a person, I don't think Leo believes that there is anything wrong with himself. Now, the writers have tried to raise the stakes for both the characters at this point in the movie, but I think the conflict could have been maintained with Nancy's transgression of of Leo's personal boundaries. So Leo's object of desire and his ability to help Nancy would have been enough to keep the conflict going between them. And Leo serves as a modern and somewhat refreshing antidote to Nancy's judgmental and shame-based views. So, for example, when Nancy talks about the 16-year-old female students at her old school and she talks about the power that they had over the male teachers, you know, and, and says she says that the male teachers were lambs to the slaughter, Leo puts out his take on it and he really puts Nancy in her place. So he makes the astute point that the girls are not there for male teachers and perhaps then that the men were in the wrong job, if that's what they thought. So it's these contradictory points of view that are very much in line with Leo's character and his role in the film. But the storyline with his mother is meant to show a level of shame for him that I don't think is consistent through the movie. So the mother wound story for Leo adds to my odd feeling that I mentioned before when Nancy was lashing out. Leo's views on pleasure and bodies would have been enough, I think, like I said, to create the conflict. And then Nancy's invasion of his privacy probably could have worked equally as well at the end of that third meeting if that mother wound sort of topic or area wasn't included. If I bring that, bring this back to stakes, what's at stake for Leo admitting his mother considers him dead? Nothing. It happened. Admitting this to Nancy doesn't do anything for Leo. It doesn't change his view of the world or his view of his job. But perhaps it could have if intimacy was one of the objects of desire or one of his objects of desire, but I don't think it is. So the personal stakes for Nancy and the externalisation of her inner conflict driven by shame and guilt 
create enough conflict in the film when she does come up against Leo's desire to do his job well and it is enough to create the external conflict in the film. So Nancy, as the protagonist, has a lifetime of inner prejudice that she needs to overcome in order to realise the full and empowered life that she's always wanted. So my biggest takeaway from Good Luck to You, Leo Grand, is when the stakes are about self actualization it's important to ensure the internal conflict has an external object to butt up against, especially when we don't see the protagonists in their real world. All right. So that's my take on this movie. So Valerie, what have you got for us for our action steps this week? I have follow-up questions. Mm-hmm. <laughs> have you been writing those down? Have you while I've been talking? Yes. <laughs> yes, I have. Right. <laughs> Let me run this past you and, and tell me what you think. Okay. In terms of the genre, we both think it's a world view. Mm-hmm. How about it being a worldview education. And the reason I'm saying this is when you're talking about stakes, I think what's at stake for Nancy is living a meaningful life. Mm. Mm -hmm. I think that is what this is about. So what do you think of it being a worldview education story where her life, you know, getting something out of her life that's more than just looking after everybody? Yeah, I like that. And I think that you know, as you, you know, you, you, we are physical beings, right? So it, and to have a sense and, you know, if you, and, and sexual longing is one of those things. So if you haven't had an education in that, it can, like any other experience of life, it shows you a new and different way of life. And it is part of an education, your personal education. So I, I like that. I think that's, that fits yeah, it's good. Okay. I, my notes are all over the place. <laughs> I could see you writing while I was talking and I thought, <laughs> is she doing something else or is she going to ping me with the <laughs> <laughs> Putting you on the hot seat, honey. That's right. <laughs> okay. You, you're talking about uh, Nancy as, as shaming Leo and judging mm. Leo. Okay. I think she shames him and judges him because she herself has been shamed and judged. And when we did the Godfather episode, we talked about how the character is a product of their environment. Mm -hmm. Nancy is absolutely a product of her environment. So she has been taught to shame herself mm -hmm. and she has been taught to shame others. Yes. I don't even think she is necessarily aware of what she's doing until Leo calls her on it. And then they have a discussion and she doesn't argue with him. She doesn't dig her heels in and insist that she is right. She actually does listen to his opposing opinion. And this is part of what is bringing the two of them closer together. And part of what ultimately leads to their intimate moment, which is when they're having a true heart to heart when mm -hmm. the facades because her name isn't nancy his name is yes. leo yeah right they, they both have a facade but by the end of it they're gone one knows exactly who the other is and their last meeting is to me the intimate meeting yes because up to that point it's it's physical he is there to provide a service yeah, and I did think about, so I had some things in my notes about intimacy as a stake because I think, you know, it's you cannot have, um, I mean, you can and it, it causes issues, right? You can't, uh, it is difficult to maintain a physical, a very different physical life as it is to have an internal life. And so there is a level of intimacy or giving over that I think Nancy and Leo both have to do, even if it's on a business transactional side of the house. And I actually think Leo enjoys that, you know, and he talks about some of his clients and what it is that he does for some of them and how it works. And they are very intimate stories. So he, he, he is there to provide a service 
and he understands that there is intimacy involved in it, but it is very constrained. It is very bounded by the rules that, you know, I don't necessarily think anybody really knows what the rules are of the engagement, right, of... But you can imply that, you know, trying to find out who that real person is or what their real life is, is a stepping outside the bounds of that intimate and physical environment that they create in the agreement. So intimacy, I think, is important. I couldn't say it was a stake, but it is something that I think is that is in the film anyway. And I actually think part of um, Nancy's shame is her inability to know how to be intimate in a physical sense and to connect her physical and her, you know, for want of a better word, spiritual side, right? So as a religious teacher, she probably has a religious belief. So she sees those as two very conflicting things. And you can see how that conflict plays out for her internally because it comes out in her words, right, and it comes out in her trying to avoid the actual intimate physical acts that she's engaged Leo to participate in. So I, it is a, they do form a connection and I think that is part of the service that Leo provides. It's not, it doesn't just have to be transactional. He is a... A considerate person and does naturally enjoy the um, the pleasure side of his job and creating pleasure for his clients. So that makes sense to me to say that. But I wouldn't say so. I wouldn't say it's a romance. If we're trying to link this, you know, link it back to genre and how it plays out in the story, it doesn't fit into a romance story for me. It fits into something beyond that that is something closer to that education it's a it's a it's an offshoot of the education part um genre of the story because of the nature and the scenario that the story writers have set up and the yeah does that does that make yeah, sense yeah i'm comfortable to you? with it being a worldview education mm. i'm i'm feeling i'm feeling confident in that I'm not feeling confident in any of the no. other. Like, I wanted to find a secondary genre. It, if I want, you know, if I was going to do a proper job, I'd have mm-hmm. to actually analyze this film from the perspective of genre, mm-hmm. and that's mm-hmm. not the point of what we're doing no. this season, right? Yeah. Like, back in season two, um, when we did Legally Blonde. I think I called that one a performance story because I didn't Mm. do a full analysis. It was just my initial impression. Well, I'm actually analyzing that film now with a client. And as I started to analyze it, I said, oh, it's not performance at all. It's a maturation story. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a, Leo Grand, I think is a really interesting film to study with respect to genre, but I would have to actually go back and spend time Mm -hmm. looking at it only through that lens. But at the moment, worldview education is feeling comfortable. Yeah, and and I felt really a bit going out on a limb, right, to not try and find a secondary genre, but there was nothing that came close to me for this movie. And I thought, you know what, the type of movie that it is, and like you said, I very much got that vibe of it could be a play. And then I thought, well, it's actually okay for it just to be that worldview story because anything else is never going to be complete and the and the the subject matter that it covers doesn't lend itself I think to it it touches on things but like you said I think it's covered off quite nicely by the worldview education genre I I don't think it needs to be anything else (laughs) So that's, you know, that's why, and that's why I said what I said. And I thought, well, we'll see if that lands. I'll see if, you know, it, see what people think about that. The other point I have is about empathy Mm -hmm. and just some ideas I had as I was listening to what you had to say. Another point of empathy here is that Nancy is very concerned with what she thinks other people think of her. 
Mm-hmm. And that is keeping her from living the life that she wants. That has always kept her from living the life she wanted. Mm-hmm. I am hard pressed to, to think of someone in my life who is not concerned with what they think other people think of them. You know, what will the neighbors think, right? Yeah. That yeah. kind of thing. And it is holding back so many people that I know. In fact, you know, I've said this before, but my friends and my family, people I meet, they know what I do for a living. They know that I want their recommendations for novels and films and TV shows. Mm -hmm. So I will often get a text or an email from, you know, writers I've met, clients I've had, friends, you know, high school friends I have. They'll Facebook me, uh, message me in Facebook. When Good Luck to You, Leo Grand came out, because it's Emma Thompson, I was like, yeah, I can't wait to see it. But it took me a while to get around to it. But between when it came out and now, I have had so many women message me and say, you got to do this, this film on the podcast. And I always say, well, okay, what did you think about it? And the comment that I have gotten back is that, it's too close for comfort. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it is, it's resonating with its audience. Yeah. So even if the specifics of the situation are not shared, the emotions are shared on a number of different levels. You get to a point in your life where you think, is this all there is? I feel like I'm fading away at the edges. Mm-hmm. This is my last chance. Now, yes. men get to have a midlife crisis, and it's a bit of a big joke, right? Oh, he's having his midlife crisis. He'll get a red sports car and you know, have an affair, and then he'll calm down. Women don't really get to have a midlife crisis, right? I mean, we, no. we have it, but we don't get to – society doesn't sort of let us – Buy the red sports car. <laughs> no, we get called Karens instead, don't we? <laughs> we get called Karens or Cougars or all that kind of stuff. But it happens. We get, I mean, that's what a midlife crisis is when we say, is this it? Is this all there is? Mm-hmm. Like, I, I want more. And oh my God, the clock is ticking. I better get out there and start living the life I always meant to live, but got sidetracked with doing all of the things that I was expected to do. Right? Mm-hmm. Yes. So the fact that so many women contacted me to say, you got to do this movie. And the com- the comment was, it's too close for comfort, tells me that there's an awful lot about Nancy's story that is hitting home. Mm-hmm. And that hitting home thing, that's empathy. Yes. All right. Today's action step. Since this is a film that's really about two people sitting in a room talking, I'm going to challenge you with a writing exercise. I want you to put your protagonist in a room with another character, any character you want from your novel, and I want you to write a transcript of their conversation. I don't want you to use any directions, no descriptions, do not write prose. Just write the dialogue and practice building a conversation from the moment these two people enter the room together to the point where, you know, the climax of the conversation, the point where some kind of truth is revealed or there's a major plot point that is revealed or something about the characters revealed. It's a hard exercise, but a really valuable one. So good luck. Let me know how you do with it. All right. That wraps it up for this week. Join us again next week when we discuss Manchester by the Sea. To support the show, please leave us a rating and review and tell your writer friends about us. For access to writing templates and worksheets and more than 70 hours of training, subscribe to Valerie's Inner Circle by visiting valeriefrancis.ca slash inner circle and follow her on Twitter and Instagram at Valerie underscore Francis. If you'd like to get my tips about books to help you read like a writer, Visit me on Facebook and Instagram under Melanie Hill Author or find out more about me at melaniehill.com.au. And remember, story theory doesn't have to be difficult. It's a tool to help you write more, not less. So take it one step at a time and have fun. Mm-hmm.